welcome back to another episode of To Whom It May Concern. I'm your host Malak here with my co-host Inara, Khawela, and Maria. Hey. Hey. So since it's September and everyone's back in school, we thought it would be relevant to discuss if schools kill creativity. Okay, so at this point in our lives, we've been through elementary school, middle school, high school, undergraduate school, and graduate school for the most part. So we've kind of seen all levels of education. And do you guys agree or disagree that based on the schooling you've received thus far that it kills creativity or it encourages creativity? I think it depends on the teacher and how they structure their classroom. I think some will enhance and allow students to use their creativity and some might not. And we're talking about creativity in the sense that it's using your imagination and having your own original out-of-the-box ideas, not just in the sense where it's artwork being produced because a lot of people think creativity can just mean in the arts yeah that's true it's like oh she's in science or chemistry where it's like how are you going to be creative with that so when i was an undergrad i was a research assistant and i was conducting these like different experiments it was funny because at one point i was like mixing these different chemicals and i was like looking at the procedure log and making sure that i did everything exactly how it was supposed to be and something wasn't adding up for me so i was having such a hard time with it and then when i went to the researcher to ask him like why it wasn't working he's like you don't have to follow the procedure log just mix whatever you want like have fun with it be creative about it and i didn't even realize that i could be creative when it comes to this it just never crossed my mind I would argue that in the sciences and in math, you would need the most creativity to think out of the box to find outside solutions to problems that t- people typically have. Yeah, it was just, it was a kind of a so do you eye-opening th- moment. So do you think we're trained to just be very systematic and procedure-like? I think so. I think the way our education system is from grade school is very systematic and it is very like structured in a way where you have to follow the rules, you have to follow your schedules, this class is for this long, the bell rings, you go to the next class, bell rings, you have lunchtime here, recess here, you can talk at this time, and then it's like, okay, after school, homework, so it's like, it's just Mm -hmm. always very structured. Although I do believe that teachers do have a big role, when I was in middle school, I used to hate history, I was never a history person, because Mm -hmm. I just found it so boring, and I found that the way teachers taught it was so boring, Mm -hmm. because it's all facts, and like, Mm -hmm history and dates and Just people's look at the names. Book. Yeah, yeah, it was so boring and I never found myself interested in it. But then as a sophomore in high school, I had this teacher and we took Islamic history, history at the time. And he just made it so much more fun. It was so much more interesting and we were so much more interactive. And I found at that point, I was encouraged to go to that class. I didn't mind doing the homework. I didn't mind reading the material, talking about it with my peers. So it does make a difference when your teacher is just as excited about the topic as you are. But I do think that for majority of teachers, it's not always that they don't want to put the effort, that they're not trying to be creative. I think they're very limited with the school system that they're working in also. Like the resources they have. Exactly. The resources, the time. A lot. Of, I was listening to the radio station on my way to work the other day, and they were talking about, they were actually calling teachers that were paying money out of their pocket to do things for their classroom. So they're put in very hard Yeah, and I always see like these like posts about how teachers will have second jobs and even third jobs so that they can pay for their actual jobs as a teacher Mm -hmm. do all these like extra activities for the students also in the environment that the teachers are in they're put in a position where they have to teach they have 50 minutes to teach 35 students a certain concept they're not allowed the time to i guess indulge all all the students is creative ideas yeah it's hard because First of all, everyone learns differently. And second of all, not just about creativity, but in general, everyone's at a different point. Whether it's their creativity or their, I guess, willingness to learn or their attention Mm -hmm. span. So it's very hard to manage all that. Well, that's why it's important for the teacher to know her students and to know how they learn best. Again, you won't be able to please all students, but I think making classes differently will touch upon most students you know so if you know somebody's more audio you're putting more videos up you know you're talking if you know somebody's more visual you're writing things out so you're for the most part yeah for the most part most people or most teachers have it audio and visual so it's like they're talking but they also will have stuff on the board or powerpoint or things like that Mm -hmm. i mean so you're you're more hands-on or like you like to talk about things you know create more groups and when you have younger students 
like you have to be willing to put that creativity because like students get bored sitting in a desk for eight hours a day especially as an elementary student we you don't have the attention span for that long to begin with anyway we're older and after a certain amount of time we have to take a break although teachers can't keep everyone entertained or do it the way all students would like i think the greater majority would take more interest when it seems more fun or mm -hmm. there's relevance behind the information that they're learning. That's hard though. That is so hard. I mean, at least if teachers can't do it in the classroom or it's too hard to do it in the classrooms, then we should really focus on what schools are doing with the money to keep their resources going. Like if a teacher can't do it in class, then we should make sure that the first programs we're cutting are not art and music. There has to be some type of outlet. If it's not mm -hmm. in the classroom, it has to be after school or in other classes where they're allowed other to. Other activities. Yeah, yeah, where they're allowed to cultivate that creativity. And there are, there's after school programs that do that. But those are always the programs that are cut first when there's no money in a school. I mean, going to well, private school. Well, because the point of school, the point of school is going and learning these basic topics. Like, everyone needs to learn science, math, history, English. So it's like, that's the essence of... But I feel like people can argue that art and music are just as important to some individuals. Well, maybe the actual art class or the music yeah, class. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But the about. extracurriculars, I'm talking about, like, after-school activities. Oh, yeah, no, I'm talking about, like, actual art class, computer mm -hmm. classes, like, music classes. Like, those mm -hmm. are always the ones to be cut first. And, yeah. I mean, we went to private school growing up and i don't think we had we weren't exposed to that much like we really did we had we art barely. class for a few years but we never really had music even no. art was cut really quickly that's true we were more science heavy and if you weren't if you didn't excel in math science and whatever you weren't really considered of Smart. the top tier Smart. yeah really basically <laughs> but even those classes like going to public school those were always your electives they were like mandatory so if it's only if you showed interest that they yeah allowed you to take it yeah, they have your, like, mandatory class. It's, like, four years of English, four years of math, or three years of math, four years of science. I mean, yeah, and, like, one art class that's mandatory. The only reason that makes sense is because you need to read to succeed in life. I don't need to learn how to do something in art in order to live the rest of my life, but you need to learn how to read. You need to learn how to do basic arithmetic. So there are some things where I can see where the argument is that those classes are necessary i just think we completely don't pay enough attention to the other ones no, but so, you have architectures you have engineers like art is also needed depending on the field that you're looking into so do you think we are all creative and then we go into these school systems and then it kills our creativity right you have like pre-k three and four mm -hmm. and you're doing all play and that's how they learn through play like that's literally like early childhood they teach through play and as soon as like you hit first second grade it's yeah more. it's structured like you go to class so you sit down in class all day mm -hmm. i do think for some people that could definitely be a thing like they maybe when they were younger they're really creative and then once they became school oriented or once it became like institutionalized learning they weren't able to cultivate that creativity and they kind of just let it go they were focused more on paying attention to the homework that they had to do or they never but gave this themselves is happening at like five six years old kindergarten's five first grade is six years old so it's not like you i don't know if anyone's realizing it okay so let's say at that age you're just starting to go to school well as you're getting older you're never given a chance to mm -hmm. cultivate that creativity so or seek that pathway so you do think our school systems kill creativity i think they do honestly definitely see i'm trying to think is it a school thing or is it a personality thing like or a society or thing. is a society so like if i went to school and the, my classes were not teaching me to be creative was that just like my personality type was just more like yeah i don't mind just doing whatever i'm told or was i doing some certain homework assignments in a creative way like could i have used my own personality well, to do my are own you learning? taught creativity or does it come from you so that's the question. Is it a personality thing or is it something that you learn? I don't think you're taught creativity. Like, I think you're born with creativity, but I think if you don't cultivate it, then it just, like, fizzles. Well, what if someone's not creative at all, but then they go to some creative class in school where it's like the reverse, like where it makes someone more I mean, creative? I guess it could happen. But I think the school system, I know Mariam was saying, or is it like a society thing or whatnot, but I think the school system is reflective on the society we live in. The people in society deem that these science courses are important and that's how we implement the school system. I think it also shows how like, it teaches discipline, I feel. And Wait, di what teaches discipline? School. Like oh. Or like the structure of mm -hmm. the classroom in the structure of how everything is it also teaches discipline which society deems high which oh. i kind of agree with yeah yeah definitely i think kids and adolescents do need to learn mm -hmm. discipline even though a lot of times they it's funny that you say that Huayla, because there's an article where a teacher was talking about asked her students 
a student of hers made a comment about how school feels like prison. Mm. So when you talk to like seventh graders or younger kids, they think that structure is a means of like imprisonment. Mm-hmm. Like we can't do whatever we want to do. We literally just have to sit here and listen to you. Like if I move a certain way, if I laugh or if I make mm-hmm. a comment, like it's so... You get in trouble. Yeah, it's so like disciplinary that I don't even enjoy it. And how many times, like even growing up, we constantly have gone to school. How many of us actually enjoyed going to school? Yeah. How many times did we complain I mean, about I'm, going to school? But you need, like, you need rules and organization. There has to be some type of structure. I get that sometimes teachers can be a little quick to punish or rules can be a little strict. But when it comes down to it, we, as individuals, as human beings, we do need some type of guideline to follow. I mean, imagine if you just put 35 seven-year-olds in a class and there was no rules. <laughs> Which there kids was no actually be, Yeah, like, if you if it, school wasn't mandatory, would they even attend? Would exactly. seventh graders go to school? I agree. I think there definitely needs to be some sort of like guidelines and structure so that the teacher could teach the material Mm -hmm. i just think we need to do a better job in making it relevant to the age group so that kids go to school and actually enjoy it i think the problem with a lot of our school system is that when you look at creative thought when it within itself the way you come up with ideas people segregate the sciences and the arts as the arts are the creative things, sciences and math can't be. They don't understand that all these subjects integrate with each other. Mm -hmm. If they were to teach it as an integrated system, then the student would have so many more benefits in the way that they think, in the the process, and we would be able to solve so much problems. So like you said, with architecture, art and math go hand in hand in that Mm -hmm. subject. Imagine what we can create if we had more students that understood that these topics relate to one another directly. A lot of times you hear students say, oh, how does this benefit me in my life? Like, how? what am I going to apply calculus to my life? So we always hear this. We probably have said it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny because anytime one of our teachers would like, we teach something that in chemistry, it's just in the textbook. It's, like, out of this world. But then when they give an example of how we actually use it in real life, you remember it. And I mm-hmm. still remember all the examples that they gave us. Or, like, this is how you use it in real life. Yeah. Or, These are the products you use. This is how they came about. Stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, so I do think that when teachers go out of their way to mention facts like that or to throw out, like, quick pieces of knowledge, that's the stuff, like, that's considered creativity for me. Taking the time to bring it back to me, that's creative enough. For a teacher, at least, when she's trying to relate to all these students i just think it takes little things like that that's right i think that's being an effective teacher if you're able to take the science or the math that you're teaching and make it relevant to the kids and help them connect it i think they learn it better like what do you said like you were able to retain that information and i think it'd be more effective yeah i used to have science teachers that would come up with rhymes i had a calculus teacher in undergraduate that did a dance to memorize an equation like there are just some People that are willing to put more effort. Sometimes though, when teachers try to be creative and you're just like, man, I just want to lecture. Can you just stand <laughs> yeah. in front of the class and just talk? <laughs> like, I'm not in nev- the mood. We're never happy. <laughs> literally. No, literally, that reminds me, like, sometimes you had to do, uh, like, a math problem. You could do it different ways to find the answer, but the teacher would take off points if you didn't do it the method that she taught. Really? Like, it was very specific. Yeah, they yeah. do that now, too. Mm-hmm. It's really? Very, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, some teachers are very specific. It has to be done the way that they want it. Even though you could come to a conclusion to that answer the same way, they don't accept it. Or you get points marked off. I don't agree with that. Okay, so there's this new system called Common Core that they're teaching in like these elementary schools where you're supposed to do problem solving in a certain way. So like my younger cousins, they're like fourth and fifth grade, mind you, and they're calling asking for help and they send me these math problems and I'm like, oh, this is so easy. You do it like this, whatever. And they're like, no, that's not how my teacher wants it. You have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And it's just completely unnecessary, excessive way to figure out the answer. And that's how they're teaching kids to kind of like problem solve now and to think about problems now. But that's not even allowing them to critically think it's just saying all of your other ways of thinking is incorrect this is the one way you could solve it yeah so that's like a way where i think it would limit limit the student and kill creativity yeah definitely (laughs) it's called common core Mm -hmm. is it an online thing no it's how teachers are teaching students now like it's it's across curriculum yeah it's across a lot of public schools that Mm -hmm. they're enforcing this new way of teaching so that all students are being taught the exact same way What do you guys think of the banned books argument that has been happening since like 1990, where schools try and ban books from their libraries so students don't have access to them? I disagree with that. Why Why are they banning these books? Like, what's their argument? The main argument is the content of these books and what children 
would be exposed to if they read them. I mean, I definitely think to a certain degree some books don't need to be taught to students. Like, if something's really explicit or whatnot, like, those shouldn't be brought into a school building just because students may be too young to even... Like, they don't even need to be exposed to that type of information. But if we're talking about, like, books... Because I know there were some books, like, To Kill a Mockingbird was challenged in some states. Like, yeah, so, like, that's what I mean. Is it? I'm not talking about Fifty Shades of Grey type of books. I'm <laughs> no, talking about, like... <laughs> they say the most challenged books are 13 Reasons Why, The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, The Kite Runner... To Kill a Mockingbird and The Hate You Give. Those are good books. I mean, some of those are recent, but To Kill a Mockingbird was definitely a staple. Like that's a I read that staple. in sixth grade. I read that, I want to say in high school, ninth grade. So here's, uh, I mean, yeah, The Kite Runner too. that was a good book. I feel like a lot of these books relate to like the racism or corruption of society. Like what is actually happening and what other minorities face. And so it's hard for them to digest that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because, like, To Kill a Mockingbird wasn't explicit at all. There might be some, like, if it's talking about death, or I know The Kite Runner has, like, a rape part. I don't know how explicit. I forgot how, like, I don't detailed even, it goes into it. I don't remember it being that detailed at all. Like, I remember them alluding to it. I don't even know if they explicitly said Yeah, they probably it was rape. they probably didn't, but... I think it depends on the age group. Like, elementary students maybe should not be allowed to read these books. But, like, high school. Or eighth grade. when Middle you're school, just... too. It's different between, like, having these books required for, like, your English classes to read versus banning it from the library to even have Check access out. to it. You know? Mm-hmm. Those Honestly, are two different things. But if we're comparing, would you rather a student uh, class learn To Kill a Mockingbird or The Great Gatsby? To kill like a mockingbird. To kill a mockingbird. So it's also if they're the taking. Great Gatsby. It's also <laughs> like a, a controversial book. book but yeah. I'm just saying, like, if we're gonna actually talk about also what the teachers are teaching, if you're spending time teaching a whole class about the Great Gatsby, where there's not as many lessons you could take versus To Kill a Mockingbird, that's also a concern. Or I would argue that I would rather have my child taught To Kill a Mockingbird versus Hamlet, in my opinion, because oh, at least they will get. A better idea of the world, its injustices, how it is now, and their place. And it's relevant. It's relevant. Exactly. So that's how you can bring real world into English, into society, how it was back then, how it is right now. Why was this book even written? So I would rather them teach that than or like yeah, Romeo, all of Shakespeare. That, no, Shakespeare, no, Shakespeare <laughs> is very important. He Shakespeare has a lot is a of great staple. Writings. It's a staple in the English curriculum. So you should learn about Shakespeare and some yeah. Shakespeare material. But yeah. yeah, I don't think you need to take Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet and you know every single play that he's ever written. There's room to change with authors and with time. I think they should also change curriculums with time. People shouldn't forget that books are also a portal to different life experiences and that reading them encourages empathy and social emotional development. Yeah, and so banning these books are going to just make it harder for us to see what that person or what that book is going to bring. And a lot of banned books have to do with religions, immigrants, refugees. Those Racism. Are, yeah, those are the topics that they stem from. So. And I don't know, I don't think you're too young to be exposed to those those topics those not, realities not in the time we're living you're definitely yeah not. especially like if we're teaching younger kids about about issues like this when they get older they're less likely to be racist i'd i'd hope and it's funny because these pl- books are banned in usually the most not racist areas <laughs> but most white one type of culture lives in that area so it's difficult for them to be exposed to other cultures, or at I least face to face or in person. So by reading these books, they can get some sort of exposure to different people in mm-hmm. the world. I think this is just another way that the people behind the system try to keep you in line, in line, or even try to keep you unexposed so that you're not thinking about it and finding more faults in the system. This is just one mm-hmm. of those things because racism is such a big deal today and bullying is such a big deal today and being ignorant is such a big deal today and it's just easier for schools to say well we're not going to deal with it than to bring up conversation about it and have students actually discuss it and entertain the idea so this has me thinking is the reason why we see so much ignorance or racism is it because schools do not even sh- expose us to these books? If we did expose books like these that are banned more to students, would we have a more empathetic, more understanding society? I w- yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, to an extent. Yeah, Or at least there 
would give an opportunity for there to be facilitated conversation in a classroom where students can air out their thoughts and ideas and discuss them in a way that's structural and productive. Mm -hmm. It's actually funny because the other day I was watching reruns of Boy Meets World. <laughs> and George Feeney. Yeah, it was the episode where Corey made a bet with Feeney and he was going to teach the class in a creative way because he was so bored with how the teacher was teaching it and they had placed a bet on it. And the story they were reading at the time, which is a challenged book today, but it's the diary of Anne Frank. And he had to, I guess, read the book so that he could find a creative way to teach it. And he goes into this class and the kids are just not paying any attention. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to listen to the book. So as one of the kids gets up to walk away, I think it was his best friend, Sean, he calls him a name. So all the kids kind of like get really quiet. And, you know, Sean yeah. like gets angry. He wants to hit him. And then that's how he draws relevance to like, well, imagine if an innocent person got called names and they couldn't do anything about mm -hmm. it. Or mm -hmm. that's how he inserted the conversation with the book. So I these books, they do breathe life lessons. I think, Mariam and Malak, you guys mentioned very important uh, topics that sh schools should incorporate. I know they're trying to do like social and emotional learning. I don't see life skills being taught at schools. Not at all. At least not when we were there. Or just like, not just life skills, but things that you need to know as an adult. We barely learned about financial aid or we or insurance or finances or just budgeting things, budgeting exactly like these things how to that, take a loan when you're going to be taking loans for graduate school and undergraduate yeah just like different things that we need to know as mm -hmm. adults or like simply just paying bills or things like that you, we're not really taught people Pe make an argument against that saying well shouldn't your family teach it teach that to you shouldn't your parents teach that to you but i feel like that's a very privileged argument to make in the sense where you don't know what these families are dealing with their situations do the family even know this type of information or are they coming from two parent households or any parent you household? always you always hear people say like when am i ever going to need to find the volume of a sphere but you can't tell me how to do my taxes. Also mm -hmm. deeming what information is necessary and what information isn't necessary to people to learn. My thing is like, why don't we incorporate both? Like, why can't there be a one class about like life skills, things that you need to know as an adult so you know how to transition and mm -hmm. make better decisions. So you're not like, wow, I took out all these loans. Now I'm, I'm in debt and I can't buy a home. I can't get a car. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why don't we teach these skills so that we end up making better decisions? I do agree though. Family, I guess should schools can't do everything for you and it's going to be your environment so like family and friends that are outside of the school do have some sort of factor in how you become as a person but that doesn't mean that schools shouldn't be teaching these things or it should just be a class that's offered like one of those common core classes like you take math you have to take life lessons <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> life lessons. how to be an individual and then science <laughs> like you know how to deal with your anger and then yeah, yeah i think English. social emotional learning is needed in classes like like we see bullying happen very often, especially now with social media, social media, there's cyberbullying. I think we need to teach like empathy, optimism, conflict resolution, and that anger management. That doesn't have to be a class in itself. Like you don't have to say, oh, next you're gonna go to your emotions class or whatever. It could just be something that's <laughs> integrated with the way you teach. We're teaching. Yeah, that would have to be very creative. And like, they do. Or like you're taking health, like integrate it when you're taking health, when you're teaching anatomy. You know, like just, mm -hmm. there are some places they could plug it in. So the way, in order for social emotional learning to be effective, it needs to be a whole school that begins to practice it. So like all, like in all, all subjects, all ages, all subjects need to er incorporate this curriculum. There's an actually an organization that does research, it's evidence-based that do this, it's called CASEL, C-A-S-E-L, and they have a curriculum and they want schools to like sign up with them to teach them how to do this and it's literally that you have, have to revamp the whole school because I used to teach like third to seventh grade about social emotional learning but it was just one class and I remember telling the my supervisor I'm like this is great that we're you know getting them m making them aware of these topics and having these conversations but this isn't effective mm -hmm. I'm like in order for it to be effective it has to be a whole school change that was willing to incorporate this in their every day because i could teach them how to deal with anger but if the teacher isn't sh showing what controlling anger looks like and she's yelling it might not be effective so there everybody needs to be on the same page in and regards to that have schools actually incorporated this though like, yeah there are schools that have incorporated but a social emotional learning majority probably haven't because it costs money too like i'm sure it costs money to change the whole curriculum and to change the whole school system retrain and those are resources mm -hmm. that our education system isn't 
aren't allotted and therefore they mm-hmm. can't make these changes that might be necessary or I mean, only the the wealthy privileged schools would be able to do it not necessarily i don't think it's specific i don't think it's the resources that's an issue i think it just like ksl is not specific to like, privileged individuals it's the, whether the school wants to sign up and actually go through this change it's not necessarily about the resources that you have so it doesn't require money to kind of change the curriculum or to re-educate the yeah, teachers well, on how to do it to like, a certain extent to a certain extent yes yeah, so i think a lot of like the social emotional learning the reason why they develop these curriculums is to help individuals who experience a lot of difficulties such as the underserved communities so it's not necessarily for only privileged individuals even though it may make it easier for them obviously because they have the resources to incorporate it but i don't think it's limiting to just money so sometimes students use their creativity in the way that they answer teachers questions so why don't we share our favorite responses to an actual like to a test or quiz yeah it's an actual like test or quiz question Okay, so one of the teacher's questions was, what do you call the science of classifying living things? And the student responded, racism. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's true. That's funny. The teacher asked, some atoms share electrons and become more stable. Describe a situation in which people share something and everyone benefits. And the student wrote, communism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're right. So the question was, what ended in 1896? And the student responded, 1895. <laughs> so the teacher for mine asked a math equation so she's like if you had three apples and four oranges in one hand and three oranges and four apples in the other hand what would you have and the student goes very large hand <laughs> <laughs> okay this is a funny one what happens during puberty to a boy and the student responded he says goodbye to his childhood and enters adultery <laughs> <laughs> adultery <laughs> That's a- why are there rings on Saturn? Because God liked it, so he put a ring on it. Ooh. <laughs> and the teacher responded, Saturn is not a single lady. <laughs> <laughs> How to change centimeters to meters, you fill in the blank. And the student put, take out centi. <laughs> Like, I appreciate these because I would never do that as a student. Right? I'm like, I would have never class, class, In biology class, I remember I wrote this down. They were like, what is the difference between meiosis and mitosis? And I was like, mitosis has a T. And I got the point. <laughs> Wait, those are spelled differently. I that's the point. Oh, she's different. Yeah, that's, one a, different. That, that's pretty funny. If I, honestly, if I was a teacher, I would appreciate these. Like, I feel like I would give students points for some of these because it's funny. Yeah, at least, maybe not full credit, but at least partial. <laughs> yeah, for their creativity. I have another one. In which battle did Napoleon die? His last one. <laughs> ah, I like it. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of To Whom It May Concern. Please subscribe, like, and follow us on social media if you don't already do so. We appreciate all the support we've been receiving so far. And after this episode, we'd love to hear funny jokes, teacher responses that you have heard of. You can go ahead and DM us and we'll post it on social media. And you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Modern Skeps. And please continue to tune in every week on Tuesday mornings and spreading the word. If you have any ideas that you'd like to hear us discuss, you can email us at modernskeptics at gmail.com. Sincerely, The Modern Skeptics. P.S. Creativity is intelligence having fun.